Welcome to Hope Church this morning, and as John, as you know, we meet this morning to share the great news of Jesus and the life that he's won for all who trust in him. Now one of that number was someone well known to many of us from St. Oswald's, Olive Cooper. So it's sad for us, but better by far for Olive that we know that she's gone to be with the Lord late last week and of course we'll share any funeral arrangements once we know of those <coughs> but it's great for Olive to know that she's with the Lord and that's the joy that we have to share with each other this morning and Marion's going to tell us something from Crosslands who is an organisation set up to share that great news Marion's going to tell us about a course that they're running <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, this is the Crosslands. Whoops, this is the Crosslands Pastoral Care Course. Now, pastoral care just means looking after one another. So we'll call it the Crosslands Looking After One Another Course. It's a nine-module unit, so you do it in nine different sections. There are no assignments or exams, and Christchurch Newcastle have uh, negotiated a group discount for anyone who wants to do it. Uh, Thirteen pounds fifty course. Uh, I'm going to do it. I think Lindsay is as well. But anyway, um, anybody else who would like to do it or think they might like to have a look at what it's about, um, I'll send you the link. If I could just read a little bit about what they say. Um, we have a community around us alongside whom we're heading for heaven. Each brother and sister is gifted and we know that we can serve with them for the glory of God. Together we're a body, a building, united by the one who's called us into his family. But the complex reality is we live in a world of pain. And that's why Christians do pastoral care. That's why we look after one another. Because we can't deny that we and those around us need help. But neither can we bring ourselves to believe there's no hope for those who are in Christ. And so we reach out to others with love and truth and perseverance, helping each other to keep going through the bad in the strength of the one who is the ultimate good. So if that course sounds like something you would like to do, have a word of me. Now Marion, this wasn't deliberate remarkalisation of your notice, but we'll switch the speaker. <coughs> <All right. laughs> Shall I do it again? <laughs> Um, certainly one thing I can say about Crossons is that they focus very much on trying to enable you to do what you need to be able to do day by day. It won't teach you the back end of everything, but it'll teach you what you need to know, so it's a, it's a great commendation for that course. Now we're going to talk about, about the people around us, and one of the things we'll be doing as Collective Church Family will be on Wednesday and Thursday, our Bible study groups will be on, Toddlers is on Tuesday, and also this week, there's the Amy Annual Conference in Leeds, to which some will, some will be going, so your prayers for that, as Amy works out more soundly what it's doing and where it's going, will be fantastic. And looking a little bit further ahead, closer to home, our AGM is Monday the 24th of April. As part of this, there will be a new church council elected to represent all of us to help us to make the decisions that we make collectively. And it's important. So please, if you're a Hope Church member and you're willing to stand to be a member of the council, you would need nominations, a proposer and a seconder who are also Hope Church members. Nominations need to be made in writing, not on vellum, but either a bit of paper or an email, and they go to Helen. And the deadline for nominations is the 31st of March. So if you think that you could contribute to the council, which I'm sure you could, do please have a thing, see if someone would propose and second you, and put your name forward. We're going to briefly pray now. Lord God, we pray for Olive Cooper's family. We thank you for Olive's life, and we pray for her family as they arrange, 
arrangements for a funeral. We also prepare for Hope Church, for our council, as we try and decide what's the way forward in the, in for individuals. And Father, we pray for Amy that they and we would develop as a group and deepen our dependence on you. We bring all of these prayers in your name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to join in our opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we know that you are here with us. Help us to confess our sins, to sing your praises, to join in prayer, and to hear your word to us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, two weeks ago we saw that Jesus, God's King, arrives in Jerusalem to serve people by dying and to pay the price that we couldn't. And we're going to stand for Abel and to sing of this king, this king who's also meek, who also serves mankind in our first song. Please stand. <coughs> of the book of Hebrews and it's been telling us about Jesus the perfect priest having paid the price once and forever and this allows all of us who trust in him to be with God free of shame and that freedom includes from the death we deserve for all the things that we have done that we shouldn't have done or that we haven't done that we should have done and we know that in the last week there'll be many ways in which we haven't given God the glory he's deserved. So let's remember now all the ways that we've fallen short, which 
for which we should renew our gratitude for Jesus' work this week. We'll just give a minute and then we'll share a prayer of confession. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own faults, in thoughts, words, and deeds, and in what we have left undone. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and help us to serve you in the newness of life, to the glory of your name. In Hebrews 10 it reminds us, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is wonderful news. And if you hold these things to be true, please join with me as we remind ourselves and each other of the truths at the heart of Christianity as we use this responsive version of the Creed. Do you believe in God? I believe in God the Father, who may be in all the world. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God who came to this earth to be my Saviour, who died for my sins on the cross, rose again from the dead, ascended to the Father in heaven, and will come again in his glory as the judge of all the people. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, whom God gives to all who trust in Christ, who makes me more like Jesus, guides me and strengthens me in daily life, and helps me to serve God in the family of the church. May Almighty God strengthen this faith in us. Amen. Amen. Now before the children go out to their time, Matthew's going to remind us of another of the great things that Jesus achieved, and of the word that describes it. The great big word is salvation, which is a word, actually, that we all know, isn't it? So it's a big word that ends in shun, but we know this one. It means to save or protect from harm. I looked it up. Risk, loss, destruction, etc. And we know rescues like... Firefighter rescuing a cat from a tree. There. We know what salvation is. Salvation is rescuing someone who can't help himself, gone up from a tree from the power line. That one. It, originally, when I gave it to Helen, this was... A cat being rescued from, uh, from a river by the arrow line, but that was um, that was a copyright replacement for cat rescue. Um, or with the terrible earthquakes that we see in Turkey and Syria, there have been stories of people saved from the rubble in the and for surprising lengths of time. Or this was a, a famous rescue. You might remember this. Um, some are a bit older. This was a plane that took off from New York. Both engines failed and he managed to land on the river and everyone escaped and he got everyone safely out before the plane sunk and there was a film made of that and it was a fantastic bit of piloting to land on the river in the middle of the city um, everyone on board was saved and his job is to save the whole planet doesn't it? <laughs> so we know what salvation is so let's, um, let's play our okay. game so this person it's a firefighter. What would they save you from? 
Yeah. Throw fire. Spot on. So how about if you are... Oh, go ahead. Who would save you from drowning? Can you guess? Yeah, so he might save you from drowning in the water. So we know about saving. But what does this have to do with Jesus? Why does Colin put salvation in his song? In the Bible, Jesus said he came as a rescuer. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Save is salvation. So Jesus saves people who are lost. Like the firefighter saves people from fires, and a lifeguard saves people who are drowned. In Colin's song, this was the first, trip, first verse. I won't sing it. Uh, Revelation, God shows himself to us. Substitution, God, Jesus takes our place. Salvation we're doing today. Sinners saved from hell. Big words, big words that end in shun. So I've done the big word, salvation, but actually there's two hard words there. Sinners and hell are much harder words than salvation. Sinners are people who say no to God. Who say, I know best than you. I'm in charge of my life, God. Which is all of us at some point. No one lives up to their own standards. No one hits the bullseye every time. No one is perfect and lives a perfect life. We aren't perfect, but God is. And if we continue living that way as sinners, living in God's world, by our own rules, saying no to God, and missing the target, eventually God will give us what we want. Life without him, but that means without friendship. Life without love, without happiness, without all the good things that God gives us. And that is what the Bible talks about as hell. This was the best picture that I could find to show a place with nothing good, but hell is worse than we could imagine. It's all the good things in life taken away because we reject the one from whom they all come. But when Jesus came, he brought salvation. He came to seek and to save the lost, to save sinners from the hell we deserve. Next week, Lindsay is going to tell us more about how. But that's the good news, that Jesus came to rescue us from hell. So we're now going to um, stand and sing while the children go out to their groups. And we're going to be singing... Um, You're the Word. You're the Word of God the Father. So we're singing about the one who came to save us, came down to earth to rescue us. Let's stand and sing. You're the Word of God the Father. <laughs>
Just before we move on, let's just pray for the children and for the work they'll be doing this morning. <coughs> Dear God, you commanded that people should come to you as little children. We do pray for the children as they hear about you. May they also see you and may you bring them to everlasting life through a, through a faith in you that glorifies you. Amen. Amen. Now Andrew's going to bring us the first of our readings before Steve leads our prayers and then Ben speaks from God to us. Andrew, please. Matthew 3, 1 to 12. John the Baptist prepares the way. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt <coughs> around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem, and all Judea, and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce, uh, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, you have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up the children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning. When I was young, it was a long time ago, my prayers were set into three categories. Thank you prayers, sorry prayers, and please prayers. The list was always longer with the please prayers than the thank yous and sorry ones. So I have like to think prayers like, please could I have more dinner? Please could I have more pocket money? Please could I go to the football match? And can I please stay out a bit longer? Not much has changed. I try hard to fit all the pleases in. But I'd like to start my prayer this morning with the thank yous. Thank you, Father, that you have opened my eyes to what a generous and loving Father you are. Not just to me, but to everyone, everywhere. Thank you for all the material things we have to share. Our homes, furnishings, money, and all the ways we can use them in a way that glorifies you. Thank you for the love we can share with others that reflects the love you share with for us, for us and for the friendships and the companionships we share with each other. Thank you for Sega Dunham and the partnership we have developed with them here and for Amy and the support offered through their local churches for us. Next, we come to the sorry prayers. Heavenly Father, we're sorry that we don't always give you the praise or recognition for what you are and what you have done for us. We're sorry for the wrong choices we make, often making other things a priority over you, sometimes making excuses to justify those choices. We're sorry that we don't tell others about you in conversations and in everyday life. Help us to make it clear to others that we are yours, and we have something special in you. Now for the pleasers. I hope you're sitting comfortably. Heavenly Father, we have lots to bring to you in prayer. Please help us to serve you better in every day. Please help all those in distress through war, famine, drought, 
natural disasters, illnesses, personal relationships. We know that if they turn to you, you will be there for them. Please give them all the things they need to alleviate their situation and enable aid workers and support agencies to work together to get them the people and resources they need in safety. Please give our government the wisdom to make the right decisions for the good of the people, not for themselves. Help them to see the bigger picture and not to put focus on themselves. Please help all those in authority all over the world to do the same. We think of all those caught up in the earthquakes in Syria and Turkey. Please soften the hearts of those in Syria who are antagonistic to all the aid agencies so that they will allow them to enter and deliver the support supplies that are so badly needed. And in Turkey, please give them hope that their lives can be rebuilt. And please let the aid and money keep coming to help that happen. And in Ukraine, also, please give them the hope that with support of friendly countries, they would stay strong against the Russian invasion and that the Russians will realize what they are doing is wrong. We don't understand why these things happen, but we trust in you and your bigger plan for salvation. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, it says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. We we'll end our prayers with the prayer that Jesus taught us, taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer. We say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks very much, Andrea and Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of a topsy-turvy land where everything is upside down. It might bring back memories of um, Enid Blyton's book, The Magic Faraway Tree. It's one of the lands at the top of the tree. And you enter it, everything is upside down. Or perhaps you've come across this poem, which I'm going to read in a moment, by... H. E. Wilkinson called Topsy Turvy Land. Try to visualize the land as I read out the poem. The people walk upon their heads. The sea is made of sand. The children go to school by night in Topsy Turvy Land. The front doorstep is at the back. You're walking when you stand. You're wearing your hat upon your feet in Topsy Turvy Land. And buses on the sea you will meet, while pleasure boats are planned to travel up and down the streets of Topsy Turvy Land. You pay for what you never get, I think it must be grand, for when you go, you're coming back in Topsy Turvy Land. That's life in Topsy Turvy Land. Well, this morning, Jesus is teaching us about God's Topsy Turvy Kingdom, where everything is upside down to our human expectations. What we expect of God's kingdom is not what Jesus says God's kingdom is like. So we need an upside down um, change of thinking as we come to God's kingdom. It's part of a pattern in this section, in particular of Matthew's Gospel, as Jesus enters the temple and comes right into the heart of Jewish national and cultural life to tell the religious leaders that they've got it completely wrong that they've seen God's kingdom from the wrong way up, they need to get their orientation sorted out. Two weeks ago, we saw Jesus, when John preached, coming into Jerusalem as God's king, 
not in a chariot or but on a donkey. Last week, when Matthew preached about Jesus' dramatic visit to the temple, we saw little children rejoicing that Jesus is king, while the religious leaders wouldn't. And today we're going to see that the people we least expect to be in God's kingdom will be there, and the people we most expect to be there will not be there. Everything is topsy-turvy, upside down, to how we would expect it to be in God's kingdom. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, give us ears to hear your message this morning through this debate between Jesus and the religious leaders and through these two parables which Jesus taught them. We pray that uh, you would correct our expectations about your kingdom. Would you set our expectations correct so that we might more effectively serve you and your son as our king. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, two points this morning. Uh, firstly, in God's topsy turvy kingdom, you enter by turning back to God, not by knowing lots about God. So, God's kingdom, how do you enter it? Not by knowing lots about God, but by turning back to God. Uh, Jesus has already exasperated the Jewish leaders at this point. As I mentioned, he's coming to the temple as if he's the boss. He's overturned the temple tables. Um, he's called time on the buying and selling. And he's allowed the blind and the lame to come into the temple. And then heal them, rather than healing the person, then letting them come in, breaking all the rules. He's allowed a bunch of noisy children to run riot in the temple, shouting his praises. He's a bit of a nightmare for the Pharisees. What are they going to do with him? So when Jesus returns to the temple, they've had a chance to think, and they're expecting him. It's now time to assert a bit of authority and to pull rank and to get Jesus sorted out. So they launch, they prepare a missile to launch to try and bring him down in public. And it's the first of a whole series of attacks on Jesus' authority, which take us right the end, to the end of chapter 22 before Jesus denounces the religious leaders uh, in a long discourse in chapter 23. So, let's look at the first missile and track the progress of that as the religious leaders try and attack Jesus. Chapter 21, verses 23 to 27. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him, by what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, well, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Well, that backfired, didn't it? But the religious leaders, they fired out the missile and end up coming back to hit them. It all links back to John the Baptist and his ministry in that passage which Andrea read out in chapter 3. John the Baptist came as a forerunner to prepare the way for Jesus. He came to make sure that people were ready to receive Jesus as the Messiah, God's King. And he did that by calling people to turn back to God, to repent. And through John's ministry, lots of people did repent. They turned away from their sins and they were baptised publicly in the River Jordan. But not the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They would not repent. They came to observe John's baptism, but they wouldn't submit to the requirements of his baptism, which were to repent, to turn back to God. Instead, they relied on their religious pedigree. 
the fact that they were physically, they could show the family tree, look, Abraham, we're already in the good books, we don't need to turn back to God, we're already in. And just as an important aside, that's one reason why we won't baptise people indiscriminately here at Hope Church. Baptism is for Christian believers or the children of Christian parents. And even if their understanding is at a very basic level, people who come forward for baptism do need to publicly turn to Christ, repent of their sins, and renounce evil, as they say in the baptism vows. And that's one thing here that the Pharisees and Sadducees weren't prepared to do. So Jesus' question there in verse 25 would have taken the religious leaders on a journey down memory lane back to chapter 3. When they had refused to repent and be baptised by John, a response that had put them at odds with the crowds of people who had been willing to repent and be baptised. And so that question from Jesus left them flummoxed. If, if they said that John's baptism came from heaven, Jesus would say, well, why didn't you believe him and get baptised? But if they said his baptism was not from God, then the people would get really annoyed because John had recently been martyred, he was a hero, and they thought he was a great prophet sent by God. So they get, you get the non-committal, we don't know. But it doesn't stop there. I don't know if you were Jesus, you might let the dust settle and kind of wander away and have a cup of tea and sit down and think, okay, I survived that attack. Not Jesus, he goes on the front foot. <laughs> he does a counter-attack, he challenges their authority very directly in these next two parables. He uses two parables, both, there's quite a lot of commonality between them, both are set in a vineyard, which is the Old Testament metaphor for the nation of Israel. According to verse 45, the Pharisees recognise that both parables are spoken directly against them by Jesus. So they're anti-Pharisee parables, as it were, with a, with a specific aim in mind. And they both share the same structure. Jesus uh, shares a parable. He asks a question at the end of the parable. The Pharisees answer the question, and then Jesus delivers a punchline. So two parables, both having the same structure. They're slightly different in orientation. The first parable focuses on John the Baptist's ministry. And the second parable, which I'll look at in a moment, starts with a history of Old Testament Israel and goes right the way through to looking forward to Jesus' death on the cross and the resurrection. So let's look first at this parable of the two sons. So verse 28. <coughs> what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, Go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. What's this story all about? Well, the vineyard, verse 28, um, is parallel here by Jesus to the kingdom of God in verse 31. The first son represents the tax collectors and prostitutes, and they were, if you like, the scum of Jewish society. People at the time would have thought, well, that's the scum. And for us, it might be registered sex offenders, extreme fascist groups, that sort of thing. The second son represents the chief priests and the elders of the people. Those are the, the cream, not the scum, but the cream of the society. The sort of upright and moral and good people, the religious, as it was a religious society they lived in. And the punchline in verses 31 to 32 could not be more offensive to the Jewish leaders, could it? Jesus is basically saying the scum of Jewish society are entering God's kingdom now. 
leaving you guys behind because they believed John's message and you guys didn't. And you, the supposed cream of Jewish society, A, you didn't repent and believe John's message back then, and B, even after you saw the other guys believing and trusting, you still didn't repent even then. Now, I don't, want no, I don't know what picture you have of John the Baptist and his ministry from chapter 3. I think it's easy to think of him as a bit of a hardliner, a tough guy who's big on God's law and not so big on God's grace and mercy. But like Jesus, John was bold in speaking to power. But like Jesus, John was also tender in receiving morally messed up people to baptism, wasn't he? As they believed in God's promised Messiah. And so when John preached... Who was it who believed him? Well, amongst others, it was the most unlikely of people. The prostitutes. The greedy, corrupt tax collectors. Those kind of people. The least likely people to turn up in a temple, turned up to hear John preached and were baptised in the river Jordan. But the religious leaders refused to. They knew lots about God's purposes, but they weren't God's people because they wouldn't turn back to God. So in this parable, we see something of the topsy-turvy nature of God's kingdom. It runs contrary to human experience. You enter by turning back to God, not by knowing, knowing what's about God. <coughs> and I think this should give us hope when we come to sharing the good news of Jesus in our culture. Like many of you do, I struggle with sharing my Christian faith with people who don't know him in a normal and natural way. But... I pray for God's help to make progress. And when I was in hospital last Tuesday with Nathan for his MRI scan, I had a short chat with a student nurse in the hospital who came to do the observations. She asked me what I did for work. I said, I'm a minister of the church. And she said, all oh, right, so you're a priest or something. I thought, uh, OK. Uh, I prefer not to be called a priest. I'm like, oh, sorry. No, 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 no. It's just that, um, yeah, the priest is a go-between between us and God. And I believe that Jesus is the one who does that. Jesus is the one who can bring us to God. So my job is to kind of point people to Jesus, uh, something like that. Um, uh, and then there's a bit of a pause, and, I, and with her question about priests, I thought, well, maybe maybe she's from a sort of Roman Catholic background, and she's used to calling me. So I asked her, do, do you have a Roman Catholic background? Um, and she said, oh, no, 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 I'm not really religious at all. What if you heard that before? So the question is, what do you do at that point in the conversation? What do you do when people say, oh, I'm not very religious at all. Do we just sort of leave it and think, okay, fine, so that person's not religious, so Jesus isn't for them, fine. That's, they, they've sort of ruled themselves out. That's... Well, I couldn't do that when I was preaching on this passage because <laughs> it was in my mind. I thought, no, Jesus came for people like her. So I thought, I've got to say something. And I thought, okay. Um, and I said, well, I was going to my mind what to say. And I drew a distinction between Jesus and religion. And I said, well, actually, one of the striking things in the Gospels is that Jesus speaks most strongly against religious people than against any, anyone else. And then the conversation moved on. But it's the change in mindset, I think, that, that challenged me and I think may challenge to us here. Um, when we say, talk with people and they say they're not religious or they don't seem religious, do we assume that they, they can't be and won't be part of God's kingdom? Or do we think, rather, in the topsy-turvy way that God is wanting us to think, this is exactly the sort of person who might enter God's kingdom? Maybe they've never heard or met a Christian who can explain to them something of the truth of Jesus. Now, I'm sure I could have done better in that conversation. You can pick it apart later. <laughs> but it's the same for all of us, isn't it? We, we try, we, we think, oh, I wish I'd said that. But the, the point is that I wasn't letting myself accept that Jesus wasn't for her because she was saying she wasn't religious. Yeah? And I wasn't letting her accept that Jesus wasn't for her because she was saying she wasn't religious. Saying, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the same thing. I'm not offering you religion and you're saying you're not religious. I'm offering you Jesus. Something different. I want to share Jesus with you. And there are many more like her among our friends and family and acquaintances and, uh, and strangers will bump into the normal course of life who are not religious, but that doesn't mean they won't believe in Jesus. So let's be praying for the Lord to work among non-religious people, to, through, through us at Hope Church, in all our weakness, 
um, that they might hear the truth about Jesus, pray for our toddler ministry, pray for the Easter events we're organising, for people to come, and pray for Ball's End too, pray for the area. I had one conversation a while back with a local church leader about um, various things, and he, he was a little bit concerned about the overlap between our ministries. And I reassured him that our main goal was to reach people who don't go to church. No, I wasn't trying to steal people from his church. Um, I hope I was right in saying that. <laughs> but you know, well, we know each other one, but it's primarily there's thousands of people there who are just going about their daily business, not interested in church at the moment, not religious, but doesn't mean they're not interested in Jesus. Let's pray for the Lord to be using us in, in that way. That's my first point. In God's kingdom, you enter by turning back to God, not by being religious, not by knowing what's about God. It's very different to our human expectations. Secondly, you inherit everything in God's kingdom by honouring God's Son, not by trusting in your religious privileges. You inherit everything by trusting in Jesus, God's Son, not by trusting in your religious background. Let's read the second parable, the parable of the tenant, which is probably more familiar to you. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a winepress in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenant seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time. The tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give them his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So again, on this cast list, who we've got? We've got the owner of the vineyard, the generous Lord God, the vineyard, in the Old Testament representing the nation of Israel, the, the kingdom of God, which Jesus is in the process of redefining. The tenants, the Jewish leaders, not just Jewish people, the tenants of the Jewish leaders, down the ages, like the religious leaders that Jesus is talking to as he gives this, um, teaches this parable. The servants of the prophets down the ages, the Old Testament prophets, sent by God to summon repentance, to tell God's people to turn back to God, like Ezekiel, all the way through, he's going, repent, repent, repent. And they won't. They just badly treat the messengers all the way through again and again. Some killed, some beaten, some stoned, ignored, rejected. And then the end is son, Jesus Christ. But he's killed because the tenants want to take control of the vineyard. The religious leaders want to take the keys of God's kingdom for themselves. They want to decide who's in and who's out and how it all works. But God, the owner of the vineyard, says, No, Jesus Christ is so, is the cornerstone, the foundation of the church, and the great stone who crushes his enemies. And the punchline is there in verse 43. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, religious leaders and given to a people who will produce its fruit. What's Jesus saying to the Pharisees here? It's becoming clearer and clearer, isn't it? Because of their incessant rebellion against God's rule through the ages, which will culminate in, in, in them killing Jesus very shortly, 
Their power and influence will be stripped away from them, and God's kingdom will be opened to a new people, a mixed group of Jews and Gentiles who respect, love, and worship the Son of God, who loved them and gave himself for them on the cross. In God's topsy-turvy kingdom, you inherit everything by honouring God's Son, not by trusting in your religious privileges. As we draw to a close, let's zoom out from the parables themselves and think about how Jesus is relating to these religious leaders. I mean, Jesus is so controversial. <laughs> He's so direct, so brave. I think this is an aspect of Jesus' character that we can easily brush aside in our mind as we're reading through the Gospels because we become familiar with it. But we naturally, in our lives, we like to avoid disruption and awkwardness and being unsettled and challenged. We prefer peace and quiet and routine and predictability. But Jesus is so controversial. Jesus is incredibly patient, yes, and gentle with suffering and guilt-laden people, as we see through the Gospels. But he's staggeringly bold in confronting the religious leaders. Staggeringly bold. He doesn't try to keep his head down and blend into the crowd. Jesus fears no one. He goes straight into the temple, purifies it, and then comes back again into the fray, and then, as we've seen today, verses 23 to 27, he silences the religious leaders, and then he's back in, humiliates them with that first parable, saying that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to go in the kingdom ahead of them. And then verses 33 to 46, he denounces the whole history the very things that they were proud of, their proud history. He denounces them. He sees it as a history of rebellion. And he says they're going to murder God's son. And that's where Matthew's heading with his gospel. It's a journey through the gospel. By the time we get to chapter 23, Jesus delivers a blistering sermon against the Pharisees and their hypocrisy and the way they've kept people from entering the kingdom of heaven. By chapter 26, the religious leaders are plotting to kill him. In chapter 27, they do. But it's not the end of the story, because in chapter 28, Jesus rises from the dead, God's king. And this is the message that Peter preaches to the Sanhedrin in Acts 4, verses 10 to 12, as after he's been arrested with John. Know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you, you healed. Jesus is, quote, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is controversial. <laughs> He's controversial. If we live and speak for him, we will end up different points embroiled in controversy. We certainly shouldn't seek controversy. It's ungodly to be quarrelsome and argumentative and short-tempered. We don't seek controversy. None of us should like controversy. It's not the way we're wired. But we will face controversy as individuals, as a church, as Christians in the region and in the nation. Because of our allegiance and our union, with a controversial Christ. There'll be times when things clash. There'll be times when they're called to stand. And it's worth facing the conflict of controversy when we do, so that more people can see our Christian faith and love and witness in action, and more people can hear about Jesus, trust in him, and be saved. Because salvation is found in no one else apart from him. Just as we finish... We thought briefly earlier how to talk to people who are not religious. But how do we speak to people who are Christian, sorry, who say they are Christian, but don't show evidence of being Christian by the way they live? Like the Pharisees that Jesus was talking to. Now, sadly, we will each know people like this, won't we? It's a fearful position to be in to maybe have lots of church chat, to 
be able to talk about Christian things in church, but not have that commitment to Christ. To believe that attending a church or being affiliated to one will put you right with God. To think of Christianity in terms of a series of duties and not in terms of a relationship, a life-giving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To deceive others into making them think that you know God and maybe end up even deceiving yourself too. Now these are the kinds of errors that the Pharisees made. With such people, be gentle and kind. Don't lose your cool. Pray for opportunities to talk to them about real faith and the real Lord Jesus Christ. And pray for them to repent. Repent. Pray for God to grant them repentance, as it says at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Think of Nicodemus, the Pharisee, by the end of John's Gospel. It was a journey, but he did repent. Sadly, some, many, will not. But some religious people will repent and find true life in Christ. And many others, non-religious people, different people, will. That's God's topsy-turvy kingdom. The people we most expect to be there will not be there. And the people we least expect to be there will be there. It turns our expectations down, but upside down, but in doing so it puts them the right way up. Because Jesus is God's king, and he knows what God's kingdom is like better than any of us. Let's pray. Father God, we're sorry when we let our own ideas about your kingdom um, block our ears to what you are saying about the nature of your kingdom. We want to ask particularly forgiveness for the way that we instinctively <clears throat> consider people who are not religious or who are against religion as being beyond your grace. And we know that Jesus came to die for them. And we see in John's ministry and in Jesus' ministry tax collectors, prostitutes, people who are living openly, non-religious lives, repenting and believing. And we pray that you would use us as Hope Church to reach out to those kind of people, to not limit the gospel sharing to people we think might respond, but to be bold and creative and reaching different types of people. And we pray for wisdom for those who are religious. Father, we fear for them, we worry at the, the danger of resting on privileges and thinking you're right when you're not. And we pray that you give us great wisdom in talking with those who are religious, and we pray that we might work among them to grant them repentance. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, our final hymn um, talks about Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's stand and sing.
some seeds. We have a great promise, don't we? We have the promise of rest with God. The church may not look mighty or glorious to us, but to God it is. And that's the reality. Let's join in the words of our closing prayer. Send us out, Lord, in the power of your Spirit. May we mix with the Son of your grace, always speak the truth. May the ears which have read your word listen only to what is good. May the feet which have brought us together walk in those good works prepared for us. For the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please have a coffee, and if there are any questions arising from notices, for example, about church council, do ask.